My name is Timothy Reed. I'm the uh, the vice president of um, of the Eden, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the um, Eden Annual Conference 2021, um, which nominally is in UNED, but um, really, as you can see, is online. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to actually welcome you here face to face here in Madrid, which is a bit of a shame. But there will be another opportunity in the, in the future. This is. Um, quite a, an important uh, conference, I think, because it's the 30th anniversary of the, uh, of the association. And um, we're looking forward to what we think will be a very, uh, a very interesting conference. I mean, this last year has been a, a great challenge for all of us and, other, and everybody working in different forms of education with the uh, change to, to online, which has uh, affected other, some of us more than others. But uh, nonetheless, it's been a, should we say, an interesting experience. And I think this is a something we can we can share in in this um this event this particular eating conference is the largest we've had organized uh until now i think with um 370 registered participants and i think it's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of interesting and and um active participation as the as the time goes on just uh to say that um while you can't actually be here physically in madrid my colleague um the local uh conference coordinator beatrice serrano has uh gone to a lot of trouble and recorded a rather nice um, virtual tour, which we'll be showing at um, 5.45 today. So I would very much encourage you to participate in and see that because that will give you a taste of, of what you're missing, really. And um, I think that's really all I have to say. I, I look forward to interacting with you over these days. And I'd like to hand over now to um, Ricardo Mayra, the director of our university, so he can welcome you as well. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you very much, Tim, and good morning to everyone. Uh, Secretary of State, uh, Professor Alejandro Diana, President of Eden, Mrs. Sandra Kuchina Softik, Eden Vice President, Professor Tim Reed, the rest of organizers, professors, students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. I would like to give my warmest welcome to all participants in this conference, hosted by the Spanish National Distance Education University, UNED, and organized by the European Distance and E-Learning Network, EDEN. This is in fact, as Tim said, a very important conference, no matter, you know, it is the 30th uh, conference. As you may all know, UNED has been an active institutional member of EDEN for many years. We are really proud to form part of it with more than 180 institutional members and over 1,100 members in the network of academics and professionals. UNED has supported EDEN activities in a range of different ways. Our lectures and researchers have participated in projects, webinars, publications, and other initiatives coordinated by the association. The institution has supported these activities both economically as well as providing access to institutional data from our innovative, uh, innovative sorry, methodological processes. And we will continue to do so because we are really feel and uh, we really feel committed. As I said, we are really pleased to belong to this association and a number of our lecturers feel very honored to be Eden Fellows. To judge from the conference program, this is a really promising conference, and I'm sure that you will all make good profit of it, exchanging the scholarship and making new and fruitful connections with your colleagues from all over the world. Congratulations on such a stimulating and thought-provoking lectures. It is certain, it is certain that we are living pretty hard times, uh, an exceptional moment in history due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has made the whole world reconsider ideas and practices with respect to the quality and practicality of distance blended higher education. However, however adverse and tough times might be, I feel that it's crucial more than ever to maintain our, our, uh, our outstanding role in online and distance education through innovative education projects targeting to the development of new learning models adjusted to the changing and flexible needs of a 21st century society. This is why conferences like the ones that concerned us here today are very much welcome. And I would say that are really relevant to discuss the present higher education agendas. Universities will be nodes in many connections with societies. That's what I always feel. 
lifelong learning will have a far more important place in tomorrow's society as careers become longer and upskilling and reskilling are needed to nurture innovation. The transfer of knowledge and continuing education and professional development will take an increasingly important role in higher education systems. I also believe that there is a lot of potential for us to continue evolving and offering academic excellence and guidance, not only in Europe, but also in other countries and zones all over the world. I'm just thinking about Latin America, Asia, etc. Because I have always felt that cooperation is a key concept. And we have the responsibility, not only to share our knowledge, results, and good practices among ourselves here in Europe, but also to cooperate with those who might need to nourish for our knowledge and expertise. Yes, it is true that an important aspect that has arisen in, the, in these recent months, in my view, is that the ongoing pandemic has pushed us all to innovate, probably, probably more rapidly than we would have otherwise. I'm convinced that universities have thought to be key actors to restore trust in society by strong value orientation, integrity, and ethics. And this is a role open universities have to play eminently. Unfortunately, as Tim said, due to the restrictions imposed by the pandemic, we are hosting the Eden Annual Conference 2021 online this year with our technical staff providing the online logistics. We would have obviously preferred, to, uh, preferred the event to be held at our Madrid campus, so that you could enjoy a visit here in the capital of Spain, but we hope you will have the opportunity to come to Madrid and to the UNED headquarters in the not very distant future. Sincerely, I feel that this online Eden conference will be an unqualified success. And, and I would like to thank everyone who has worked untirely to make it possible, especially the president and the vice president of Eden, as, a, as well as the people involved for the, magnificent, for the magnificent, fabulous organization of all the details have, that have made this event possible and for your lifelong commitment to international high quality education. And of course, all the speakers and moderators who I am sure will show us many fruitful paths for thinking about the issues that will lead us to the university of the future. And so I would like to thank you all for your enthusiastic, thoughtful participation, which I am sure will extend far beyond the opening of a conference today. I hope that you all may profit from the enlightenment of the educational topics discussed in the conference, and that you will use this knowledge—that that, that you will use this knowledge for the betterment of our students, our universities, and society in general. I'm sure and convinced that the aims of the conference will be fully achieved. That's what we are here for. But more importantly, this is what the game of science is about. Let me just conclude. May you all continue basking in the light of both knowledge and wisdom. And may all our universities continue growing and evolving in the good direction, but always together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, for your, uh, your poignant and inspiring words. I think it's the, uh, the perfect start for the, for the conference. Um, I'd now like to, to pass over to um, Alejandro Tiana, who's the Secretary of, um, of State for Education in Spain. Alejandro. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rector, uh, President, Vice President, and Secretary General of Eden. It is uh, my pleasure to be today with you and to see, even through the screen, so many good friends, some of them that have been seen for, uh, for a long time even. So it is, it is my pleasure to, <laughs> it is my pleasure to, to be with you today. And, uh, and also let me express my thanks for giving, you, giving me the opportunity to say some words at the beginning of this, of, of this session. Well, as, uh, as I was the, before a rector of UNED, I was involved in, in Eden and I know about Eden, but now I am in a different position and I have to deal with uh, not only uh, higher uh, distance uh, teaching, but, but for a more general uh, view about basic and secondary education also. And I have to say that this, 
this year has been really uh, uh, well um, uh, a very well I would say interesting year. <laughs> interesting is a word which <laughs> it was it, it was a difficult year. I'm sure that you all agree with with that. But it has it, it has been a real opportunity to think about many things of, of education. About 15 months ago, uh, the face-to-face -face education suddenly stopped all over the world. In some few days, in, in, in all countries, and we had the same experience, and we had to adapt to a new situation. I I, I prefer to say the face-to-face. Education stopped, but not education stopped because education should continue and, and had to continue. And we had to adapt very quickly and, and, and move to another ways, another uh, mixed systems for giving education to the young people and not so young and not the young people. And this has been really a challenge for, for our, all our education systems. It has really been for universities and for virtual distance and so on, uh, or mixed uh, universities, but it has been even more challenging for the general system of education. And um, I, I think, well, it's not only my, my thinking, but I'm sure that education systems were adapting to digitalization in education the years before. And we have invested a lot. My country has invested a lot, for instance, in, 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 in giving good access uh, of schools to, to, to high speed connection and also Wi Fi and so on. But um, the use of these uh, digital tools was, um, so to say, a slow move, so to say. And, and, and teachers were, of course, in, uh, trying to, to, to implement uh, new ways, new uh, software, and new uh, programs, new ideas, uh, methods, and so on. But more slowly, that the system probably uh, would be uh, able to do. And this, uh, this uh, pandemic has forced that us to, uh, to speed up all, 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 all the system and has given us the view that we were leaving behind in some, in, in some field, you know? And, 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 and this situation has provoked a lot, of, a, a lot of challenges for education systems. Digitalization and all the consequences connected with that is one of, the, of, of those. And it is very interesting for for Eden, and as, 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 as it is its main way of work, but, but also the issue of uh, curriculum. What knowledge, what knowledge is really necessary for, for the people and what could be replaced and what cannot be replaced and, and should we focus on, on that? But also how we, especially for, for young people, how we uh, uh, um, uh, adapt to uh, the development of well-being of people in, 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 in education uh, systems and so on. And this, this is very crucial for all education systems. And we are thinking all about that. And I have been involved in a lot of, of meetings with uh, uh, education ministers in the European Union, but also in Latin America and also OECD and, and so on and so far. And more or less the challenges are similar. And I want to say something which for me is very clear. Uh, we have experienced the possibilities of digitalization, which means also of developing um, online uh, distance, but also mixed methods in education. We have experienced that, that, that change and, and the values of, 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 of those approaches. But at the same time, especially for basic and secondary education, we have really understood that face-to-face -face is also crucial for education. And that means it's really, really important, especially for young people, for adolescents, uh, teenagers, and so on. And, and, and how can we take the best of these two worlds, so to say, 
I know I am not sure if they are only two or a mix of, of them, but how can we use that in the most profitable way uh, for developed education? And I think that probably for universities, for different universities, it, it is a, a, a great chance to, to, to give a, a step forward in that sense because people have realized the importance and the possibilities of, 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 of the methods uh, in, in, in open universities we are using and we are very used to, 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 to well, to develop. But, but at, this, at, at, at the same time, uh, for the rest of the, of the education system, it has also underlined the value of face-to-face, -face, emotional stability, well-being, and so on. This also affects to higher open universities, of course, but it's, it is more crucial for young people uh, staying at school. So. Uh, so in my view, and I am not trying to develop much more than that, but in my view, uh, now we are in a, in a situation in which we need to think about what we have lived, what we have experienced, and what are the lessons we can take from from that, uh, we have, we needed to, to react very quickly and to take decisions, well, very quickly and sometimes without a strong evidence of what was going on. But we needed to keep education going on and, and, and have young people and elder people and so on uh, involved in that situation. But now, after a while, in, in, in a more in, in, in a more quiet situation, could you say, even not uh, ended, but, but, but much more uh, easy than, than, than the year before, uh, we are in a situation in which we need to think about and we have to take lessons uh, based on the experience we have lived. In, in many countries, we are now involved in that and we are trying to develop new kinds of, 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 of of experiences and ways of, 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 of action, so to say, but we need uh, people working and thinking and, and building knowledge on education, helping administration, the school, universities, teachers, professors, and so on, to develop uh, a, a, a more, a deeper knowledge of, 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 of what are the possibilities we, we, we have. And we have had that experience and from that, I think that uh, we are more conscious of the of the challenges we are we are facing, and that's why I think that meetings like yours now today and these days are really are really helpful and valuable because um, I I am sure that you will contribute to this common knowledge we need to develop education in a more uh, humanistic way, more adapted to personal need, uh, but also to the, the, the development of knowledge, education, uh, science, which is really uh, uh, anesthetic in the, in the times we, we live in. So thank you very much for your kind invitation. I'm very grateful for that, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share some words with you, and I wish you the best in these, in these days. Uh, it is a pity you cannot um, take the opportunity of being in Madrid or whatever, but well, life is so, and I'm sure that you will take this opportunity in, in another way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alejandro, for your uh... Your, your wise and relevant words and uh, speaking as a, as a lecturer at a, at a distance education university, I think we can very, be very grateful for a government which supports and values the uh, online and distance um, learning and education in, in general. Thank you very much. So I'd like to hand over to the Eden president now, uh, Sandra Cucina. Thank you, Tim. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Eden annual conference on behalf of the Eden. First of all, I would like to greet distinguished Secretary of State Alejandro Tiana, distinguished Director of UNED, Ricardo Mayral, 
my dear colleague team, all the speakers uh, and participants, all the people getting around the organization of uh, this uh, conference, which is a way to celebrate the 30 years of Eden existence and work. Eden uh, is what we often called a smart network for professionals uh, aimed to help all those engaged in education to gather around to find a place to share their knowledge and experience, to get new ideas and to make some changes, whether it's on a local or international uh, or, or way. Uh, this year, um, I don't want to repeat myself because my colleagues have already said very nice introductory speeches. Yes, we are faced with the great challenges uh, and it was really a challenging time. I can only second that uh, maybe uh, so far, we thought that education is something which is ongoing and we didn't take it for granted, but maybe the challenges we faced so far weren't so maybe so high prior on a priority on our agendas and things to change took really time. Now we are faced with a challenge, but we do not have time to make thinking how to do changes, but we have to do such changes immediately. We have to do them now, especially regarding the digital digitalizations and digital transformations, which is something which is present for a number of years, but maybe we do take time to reflect on it and to see if we can uh, wait a little bit longer to make some uh, adjustments uh, in our work. Eden is here uh, to gather all those interested to share the so far gathered knowledge and expertise on these present challenges. And we should take them as an opportunity to make these changes which were needed maybe even before, but now are definitely something which has to be done. I'm coming from Croatia and Mary, my universities and school education are very much oriented to the face-to-face -face, uh, education. We do have online learning, uh, but it's not so much present. And talking to teachers, uh, especially in higher education every day, I often ask them, are you going to uh, back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, teaching and learning after this pandemic finish? Because we think uh, at the beginning, we thought that uh, maybe this is something just temporary and we could go back to the times which we had before the pandemic but the answers from the teachers are no we are not going back definitely changes which have happened have left significant impact that the the the, the awareness of teachers and the students have become such that they see there are no way back what we have to do is not to stay on one position. What we have to do is to go forward. We have to move to the future and to adapt what we have experienced so far to the ways uh, which will be in the future. Now we have really good opportunity to think how our education is going to look like, not tomorrow, but today as well. Because we do not have times uh, to think about it what we will do in the next two years. We have to act now. And we have to forget the past because there, this is something which has gone and it cannot be uh, go back. Such as we forget about the cars uh, um, which we had 30 years ago, the phones which we had 30 years ago, the industry which was 30 years ago. We have adapted much more easily to new ways of using some facilities in our, our lives. I'm always uh, surprised how difficult it is for education to make such changes as we, as we did in other ways of uh, our life. And I'm certain that this conference will be a good place to share new knowledge, new information, new researches which we have gathered so far and that we can jointly find the best uh, uh, proposals, guidelines, uh, suggestions how we can proceed in our work. And based on the knowledge and ideas from others, we can shape our own experience and adapt it to the best way, uh, which is uh, good for our uh, situation. 
Um, not to go too much uh, in uh, seconding what has already uh, been said, I think the importance is in, in messages and in lessons. And this is why the title of this year conference is Lessons from a Pandemic for the Future of Education. Let's just be aware that future is already here and we do not have time to make uh, long plans for our future. I'm certain that with 370 delegates from 55 countries, among them 28 European countries, we will have quite wide global experience ahead of us in these uh, days. We have over 50 papers, uh, 13 workshops and a number of other sessions where our participants and speakers will present their so far gathered knowledge, uh, research and experience, and every one of us can take something for us to implement in our everyday work or even in our daily, daily life. Uh, in the end, I just wish to thank our host, the UNED, uh, who has been uh, for a number of years with Eden, but has taken uh, the, the uh, I would say, challenging uh, organization of this conference as is its online conference. This is something which di I didn't even uh, thought about when I started my presidency. I was thinking that everything was going to be face to face. But as we successfully encompass uh, this uh, move to online environment, I think we are uh, also um, possible for other changes uh, uh, as well. Also, I'm wish to thank the Blackboard and AskNet for solutions to be principal sponsors of uh, EDEM conference this year. I wish to thank the conference program committee for their hard work in uh, setting up and shaping the conference program. The PhD committee, symposium committee, which did uh, which was yesterday, a uh, very nice, uh, I would say, uh, a session. Uh, also, Best Research Paper Award Jury, the Ulrich Bernat Foundations. I wish to thank to all keynotes, authors, moderators, and chairs for engaging to make this conference, which we also have this opportunity to celebrate the 30 years of Eden, special and worthwhile, and which will give us, each of us, thoughts to think about what we can do better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you very much to all of our um, speakers in the inauguration. I would just ask you to hang on for one minute, please, and smile at the camera because we're going to take a, a group photo to remember the, uh, this occasion before we move over to the, um, to the plenary session. It's just a, it's just a minute to give our um, technicians time to get the cameras up and uh, change the view on Zoom and, and take, a, take a screenshot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I think uh, I think you've had a, enough time. Thank you. So we're going to pass over to the uh, the second part of this uh, morning first morning event with our with our um, two uh, uh, keynote uh, speakers. Each speaker will have um, half an hour for the presentation, and then will there be fifteen minutes for the the questions. So I'd kindly ask you to uh, formulate your questions in the chat, and we'll uh, we'll we'll capture these. Um, these questions, then I'll ask the speakers the uh, the questions. I think uh, prior experience shows that switching people's microphones on and uh, letting everyone uh, actually participate would be would in, in some sense be a nicer way of doing it. it can be tricky with uh, with the sound quality. So I think we'll uh, we'll do things in in that particular fashion. Okay, thank you. So let's start with our our first uh, speaker, uh, Frances Pedro, who's the director of the UNESCO Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean. I mean, he joined UNESCO's education sector in Paris in 2010, and his team looks after technology in education and education policies, including national policy reviews and comparative research in order to ensure the alignment with the SDG4 Education 2030 objectives. Thank you very much, Francesc. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure for a number of reasons to be here today. First one is because it's a kind of a virtual come back to uh, the first university I had the pleasure and the honor to work, and that was UNED. So uh, greetings, uh, warm greetings to the uh, current rector. Second, because it was the place where I think more than 30 years ago, I had a chance to meet Alejandro Tiana, 
Secretary of State. And uh, as, I, as he said, never, well, we haven't seen each other for the past maybe two or three years. Um, third, and most importantly, because I've been following Eden activities online over the past months, and I have been enjoying many of them. So I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to bring any new insights to what uh, I have learned over the past uh, uh, webinars. And finally, last but not least, because uh, I'm really looking forward hearing what Professor Lorillard is going to present. So, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do my best to just make a humble contribution. And I just wanted to uh, make sure that um, um, the, I'm doing this well, yes. I think so. Yes, here comes my, my presentation. I just wanted to make uh, um, some reflections about, uh, you know, innovation trends that were already in the landscape well before the pandemic and how the pandemic is making some of them even more attractive, so I would say. Uh, so first thing, maybe we should start by asking ourselves, how was teaching? Well, I'm going to uh, look at this from the perspective of traditional universities, not necessarily distance teaching universities. So how was teaching before the pandemic? And let me share with you a picture that I think uh, many of you, particularly those coming from European universities will recognize. It comes from Bologna and is dated uh, from the 12th century. And I think that some of the phenomena that the, the painter already uh, um, uh, represented in this picture, we're still part of our memories uh, as a students and even as teachers. Look at this, uh, you know, some people talking while you are uh, as a teacher uh, lecturing, um, some people discussing or without having anything to do with what you are teaching. Um, let me see if I can find, yes, my preferred one, which is, uh, you know, the one that is taking a nap, which is something that I don't remember myself to have experienced while I was teaching, but nevertheless, it looks like it has been uh, uh, the uh, traditional experience for many of our students. And some of my colleagues would agree with that probably. So, well, this was certainly not the experience of many of us, but nevertheless, I would like to say that we have uh, very little evidence about what is uh, teaching in higher education today. I mean, in, in empirical terms. So what, what is the real meaning of teaching and how this teaching has evolved over say the past 20 years? Um, let me, well, there is plenty of, uh, of indications. Uh, this comes from um, um, uh, 237 uh, European universities. Uh, where a researcher, Professor Leon, um, inquired about the most used methods, uh, teaching methods, in a program that is uh, usually geared towards uh, the development of practical skills and competencies. It is business administration. Okay, so surprisingly, um, you know, <laughs> the most used teaching method in such a practical program is a still lecturing. Um, I think that that was really, really uh, a shock for me. Then I look into something that uh, um, can supplement this perspective, which is, um, you know, a similar program. In this case, it's economics in U.S. colleges and universities. And uh, just a, a few months ago, uh, research was published showing the evolution in, method in the use of different methodological strategies uh, when teaching economics. Um, I'm going to give you the full picture quickly. Um, you see, I mean, there are some phenomena that have evolved quickly, like the use of PowerPoint on your left-hand side, the um, introduction of films and videos, clickers, which is something that we don't tend to use so much in Europe, and a small uh, step towards uh, the use of games and simulations. But if you look at your left-hand side, you will still see that most of the teaching is about lecturing and presenting graphs on blackboards, you know, with a piece of chalk. I mean, that is um, the uh, reality of teaching and learning in, the, um, in, in some of the most prestigious universities in the United States as well. So it doesn't mean necessarily, uh, sorry, and I just wanted to say also that you can see as well uh, a small uh, indication that some active 
um, uh, discussions with uh, among students, as well as some attempts to promote cooperative learning have also been introduced, but this is coming only from the very last decade. Now, it is not because we lack theories about the need for engaging in a more active perspective of teaching and learning, just putting the student at the center. I think that moreover, um, or in, in further than the uh, pedagogical imperative that has been you know, around higher education, teaching and learning for more than a century already, I think that now we can certainly agree that innovation when it comes to teaching and learning in higher education is more than a pedagogical imperative. And I, I would like to discuss with you four of the most important drivers. The first one comes obviously after the, uh, the experience of the pandemic. I'm bringing some data from the United States because it is probably one of the higher education systems, uh, which is, if not the, uh, the richest, one of the um, uh, richer in terms of data availability. As you can see, um, both the students and teachers have uh, become more optimistic when it comes to the use of technology in teaching and learning in face-to-face -face, uh, campuses. I think that if you compare both sides, you won't see uh, major differences, except when it comes to uh, the very last point, which is online proctoring, where you see that the students seem to be quite happy with that, while teachers remain reluctant to online proctoring, or at least, you know, uh, tend to be more pessimistic than optimistic. So in a way, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the pandemic has contributed to change our perspectives. I think that uh, Eden President uh, was uh, uh, elaborating precisely on this following her own experience, and data certainly confirms that. Uh, the second driver for me for innovation is the current emphasis on skills. It's not only about changing the perspective from content provision to the development of skills related to the corresponding uh, course or program. It is also about um, uh, starting to think of the importance of some transversal skills that seem to be at least uh, um, if, if you use data coming from um, uh, um, surveys uh, in, uh, in companies um, that some of the most required skills by at least UK companies are not really related to the actual content of the profession or the degree, but go beyond that. And the question for us is how much are we really assessing the development of teamwork or critical thinking in our students or for that matter, in which, in which, in which ways uh, the means for uh, evaluation that we implement in our courses really put the emphasis on problem solving. That's the second driver for me. So the question is, uh, you know, how you combine um, the emphasis on making sure that uh, academic progress is made, like the Pythagoras theorem, with uh, uh, some room for creativity. So for you, this kind of uh, answer would be an A or an F, uh, fail. Um, up to you. Now, a third driver lies in the diversification of student academic profiles. I mean, I'm taking here some of the data uh, from the, mo the most developed countries in the world, but I think a similar picture uh, uh, would emerge if we presented data coming from Latin America uh, as a whole, or even from East Asia. You would see that uh, the net access rates uh, show us that uh, most likely a member of uh, um, a young generation uh, it will go to some form of higher education nowadays. And that means compared to previous uh, generations that we are uh, gaining a lot in terms certainly of um, um, equality of access, of democratization, but certainly we are also getting more diverse students with less uh, um, academic engagement. Just let's compare, drawing again on a US study, the average weekly study hours of a student back in 1960, uh, uh, which were roughly 25 hours per week, with what was happening only five years ago. So this is a reduction of 50% less. Does this mean that today's students are less uh, clever, less intelligent? 
Well, not necessarily. It simply means that they probably are less academically engaged. So in a way, they have to find room for other activities um, you know, at the cost of um, reducing the amount of time devoted to studying. It is probably because school systems nowadays prepare for a different type of teaching and learning activities. So in a way, the more diverse is our student uh, body, the less we are going to find the speaks in, um, in student engagement for academic work that we used to have when we ourselves were young. The fourth driver is the need to improve um, the productivity or the efficiency of higher education. Just look at the column which uh, uh, demonstrates the uh, stark difference between the uh, um, gross access rate to higher education, which is in orange color, with the actual graduation rate uh, in Spain, in this same country. As you can see, there is an immense loss here. It is not only about individuals that see their expectations lowered dramatically, but it's also about an important amount of public effort uh, and also you know, of families' expectations that are never fulfilled. And I think that there is a, a, a growing trend to see in which ways, while keeping the same amount of investment in higher education and just into brackets. Let's remind ourselves that the next fiscal year is going to be even more difficult for higher education all over the world. I mean, uh, how can we uh, re just keeping the same uh, effort in terms of investment in higher education be more productive, make sure that we graduate more students. This is typically a problem we face in higher education in distance teaching universities, but not, not only that. This figure uh, corresponds to the overall education system. So these are the four drivers. Now, what is the response uh, to these four drivers? How are higher education systems globally evolving? Well, now I have to say that what I'm going to present is the result of our institute's approach. It's not necessarily the only uh, truth. Uh, might be other uh, innovations or innovation trends emerging, but we just gathered uh, um, enough evidence as to make sure that the four I'm going to share with you are backed by data. The first one uh, is the dramatic change uh, from the perspective of how syllabuses are to be designed. I mean, you may think that this is not really relevant, but we do believe that this is extremely relevant because it is an indication of a change of culture. When you stop uh, creating your uh, course programs in just as a, a continuum of content delivery and start thinking about setting objectives which are linked to the development of a specific skills or competencies, be those academic or professional, then you have a first, you have done a first step towards changing the uh, pedagogic approach uh, to your teaching. Um, this shows the recent evolution between 2010 and 2015 in uh, European universities, those that are members of the European University Association, when it comes to the introduction of that kind of different perspective, uh, uh, focusing on the identification of the goals that the student has to reach by the end of the course. And you can see that the progress is really impressive. Um, just to give you an example of what I mean by that, um, I would say that what makes sense when using the objective setting approach is really to focus on a competency-based approach. And here you have examples coming from areas such as economics, uh, communication, and biology, where you can see you know, that the uh, behavior, so to say, the expected behavior at the, at the end of the program is really well depicted. I mean, it is far more complex than this in many cases, and I think that it also applies certainly to uh, distance education. Uh, first one then. Second, more impressive, I would say, because it certainly translates into completely different um, learning practices and expectations on the side of students as well, is about the emergence of uh, uh, problem-based learning, PVL, as the new paradigm for undergraduate uh, uh, programs 
uh, in uh, Western Europe and the United States. What I'm presenting here is once again, data coming from, from US uh, colleges and universities. And you will see that uh, roughly um, uh, two thirds of um, uh, universities and colleges require for all the students, or at least for some students, uh, the PBL approach. And, and this is a fantastic change because it's the one that follows not only the idea that we need to change the perspective about designing the courses, it is also telling a lot about how the actual practice uh, of teaching and learning within the classroom is also changing. It also includes a good deal of uh, cooperative work among students, but it cannot happen unless you have a very uh, restrictive I would say, um, working conditions when it comes to uh, both teachers and, and the students. However, I think that PBL is going to win uh, this race because it's the most appropriate uh, teaching approach when you focus on the development of practical skills. How can you learn how to uh, uh, ride a bike if it's not riding the bike? I think that that's, that's the point. The third trend goes to hybridization. Um, just, um, you know, we all know, and I think that has already been said by, um, uh, by some of the, um, uh, of the panelists before, I think that hybridization was already there well before the pandemic, as many of the other trends I'm presenting today. But I think that the pandemic has uh, made us all aware as once again, uh, Eden President was saying that hybridization, I mean, that kind of uh, way of mixing uh, the benefits of face-to-face uh, -face exchanges with um, an intensive use of technology, particularly for uh, content delivery, that is uh, winning again more and more adepts all over the world. I mean, if you just focus your attention on what the students say, uh, you will see once again coming from a very recent uh, survey in the United States that uh, the, even in that context where the students are mostly living in a campus, which is not necessarily what is happening, for instance, in the majority of European universities with some clear exceptions. Uh, I mean, you will see that uh, you know, it is telling us a lot that a student that really lives in a campus would like to follow some of uh, her courses totally online or in a hybrid format. It is not only telling us about uh, how well equipped they are, which we know it is still a problem uh, in some uh, regions of the world. It is uh, not only telling us how well connectivity works in that campus, but it's also telling us a lot about their expectations. And actually, I would say that uh, the discussion about hybridization will go in parallel to the discussion about the, uh, uh, how likely teleworking is going to stay also in universities for researchers and even for teachers. So I think that uh, hybridization has, gone, uh, has got speed uh, uh, you know, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, the flipped classroom, which is not certainly what the picture is showing, I mean, but I think it's a good example of hybridization. Um, provided that you work in a higher education system where you can count on a student engagement, which is not always the case. My own experience in countries like Spain, France, Italy, I mean, show that uh, when you request students uh, to prepare themselves, um, you know, at my time wasn't yet uh, watching videos, but rather, you know, preparing uh, readings. Um, well, the fact was that the majority of students didn't find the time to uh, make uh, a room for those readings, and those who were able to do it didn't dare uh, to state clearly in the classroom that they had already uh, gone through the material. So I think that this is a completely different perspective uh, when you uh, teach in the United States, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, or in the Netherlands, and probably in many 
uh, Nordic countries as well. Sorry for the rest of countries, never had the experience of, uh, you know, judging by myself, the level of a student engagement. So if your school system, so to say, prepare for that kind of engagement in learning processes, which is not necessarily the case all over the world, well, probably the flipped classroom approach is a winner once again, because it provides teachers with the opportunity to really make things happen and not simply uh, in the classroom and not simply telling stories uh, and uh, sharing content during the classroom, more maybe during uh, the discussion afterwards. And finally, uh, that goes very much for those of you who work in distance teaching universities. I think that we have seen the consolidation of distance higher education for the masses. I think that it is important uh, maybe that you realize that the experience of uh, many students in Latin America nowadays for undergraduate programs is already in some countries like uh, uh, Brazil or, uh, or, or Honduras, or, or even Colombia tends to be increasingly online. And that doesn't go necessarily or only for, for postgraduate students, adult students, so to say, that are seeking um, an opportunity for, for an opportunity to uh, get um, reskill or, or upskill. I mean, it also goes for young students in contexts where they are expected to work uh, because otherwise they cannot afford to pay the fees that uh, even public universities, even public universities, I'd like to insist on that, require them to pay. So comes as no surprise that even before the pandemic, we could so speak a spike in the um, um, demand for higher education in, in Latin America. And I think that more is going to come after the pandemic. Now, once again, let me turn to the United States where you can see a very interesting com comparison between what was happening before the pandemic, that was the fall of 2019 in blue, where you can see that distance education programs were receiving less attention and actually losing uh, uh, at a rate of 4.5% uh, yearly uh, uh, the demand from students. And after uh, the pandemic started in fall 2020, you can see a spike again in terms of the rise of the demand. And more in interestingly, I think that the ones that are winning this race are the ones going for the provision of part-time uh, programs, either graduate or undergraduate. I mean, it's not necessarily that people do not expect uh, to go to university. I think that the experience, the massive experience of uh, tele-studying, so to say, um, has been really determinant in the appreciation of uh, families and students alike of the possibilities of uh, distance higher education. Now, let me just go to the end. Um, I just presented a very, I would say it's not personal because it comes from the Institute, it comes from UNESCO, but anyway, one possible approach to the uh, current status of teaching and learning, to the drivers that require uh, us to uh, look for innovations and what are the uh, innovation trends that seem to be emerging globally. Of course, you can have probably uh, different uh, perspectives. Now, the question is, well, this is quite interesting, but um, are we going to make sure that through uh, making these innovations happen, um, students are going to learn better or are going to learn more? What is the uh, uh, empirical research telling us? Well, <laughs> I would say that the first conclusion, which I really hate, is that uh, we always come to the same uh, paradox, the same story. More research is needed. Okay, let me just uh, uh, share with you what we have been able, able to find. When it comes to the first uh, uh, trend, which is the uh, objective uh, versus content um, setting approaches to uh, de designing courses, well, I have to say that we haven't been able to find any empirical evidence. We can uh, certainly claim that uh, there is an implicit uh, move towards a cultural change that is much needed. And it might well be that uh, this has uh, a powerful effects in the long run. 
But uh, well, as you can imagine, it is very difficult to demonstrate empirically that the objective setting is superior to content setting uh, uh, programs. Now, we also wanted to say a few words about the cost estimates because something can be really interesting. It can provide uh, um, wonderful opportunities for learning gains, but their cost could be not available to all of us. So we just added another column. And in this particular case, I think that you would agree with me, the cost of such a move would be probably marginal, uh, if not tending to zero. Now, PBL. Well, PBL is uh, controversial. Let me say, first of all, that uh, according to cost estimates, um, designing a PBL uh, course or program could uh, represent an investment equivalent to at least three times uh, the amount of effort that it will be required by a traditional uh, setting. But certainly, um, you know, we already have some evidence uh, dated back already uh, more than a decade, uh, demonstrating that PBL in higher education tends to be superior when it comes either to deep learning, not surface learning, or to long-term retention of concepts. I think it is also important uh, that the link between PBL and a skill or practical uh, competencies development is made, and also that the satisfaction of the experience of both the students and teachers is superior. Yet, uh, when it comes to the effect size, I mean, uh, unfortunately, is not really so impressive. It goes to point 11. Now, let's go for the third one which is hybridization. Probably we are going to see uh, many more empirical studies um, coming in the, uh, uh, in the coming months, I would say, when the universities restart courses, particularly in Western Europe, United States and Canada uh, in September, certainly. But uh, looking back, we can see that hybridization by itself doesn't mean necessarily an increase in results, in learning gains, but it can really bring uh, a lot if used in combination with problem-based learning. I think that uh, there is also a proof of better student engagement through the use of the language, so to say, and the uh, idiom uh, that is more suited to their generation. However, uh, the estimate says that the, uh, if you decide to go for hybridization, you could prepare to pay uh, double the cost of just uh, keeping uh, traditional. Once again, hybridization in combination with PBL may bring an effect size of uh, 0.5, which is really, really impressive. And finally, well, distance education, I, maybe I shouldn't have said anything or haven't prepared anything about this. Uh, we all know, I remember when, when I first joined UNED, uh, I started learning about the no significant difference phenomenon. And I have to say, that uh, I haven't been able to go beyond that. So uh, I think that the, the most important conclusion here is that good uh, distance education can be uh, far more costly than face-to-face -face education, certainly. But if you want to really uh, um, uh, go for higher retention rates and also promoting uh, measured learning gains compared to face-to-face -to -face teaching, then you have to increase the degree of interaction. So practically, it is as much as saying that one-to-one, -one, no matter if it happens face-to-face uh, -face or uh, using some kind of technological support, is superior to any other kind of uh, uh, group teaching. Okay, So that's how far I can go. Now, I think that I would like to finish simply uh, uh, telling you the story about this student, uh, Wang Chol. Wang Chol is a student in a Dutch university, a second degree, a second year program in, in, uh, in science. And um, the dean of his faculty has decided that next year they will be introducing uh, an innovative approach to teaching, and that's block subjects. You may have heard and read about this. So instead of having different uh, courses uh, along the same day, changing every hour, you have one, two, or three weeks devoted to just one particular subject. OK, now um, the, um, the dean is really excited about this because he went to uh, 
the University of Victoria and, and saw how impressive this was. And so he decided to go for it. Now, this is my very last point. Is this the right approach? I mean, shall we continue talking about uh, uh, teaching and learning innovations simply because we see things that appeal to us or we should start changing our culture and becoming more academic as we are all praised to be, become more academic when it comes to teaching and learning and look first at what the evidence says. Thank you very much and congratulations for what I hope it's going to be an excellent event. Thank you very much. Back to you, Timothy. Thank you very much indeed, Francesca. Very interesting presentation. You touched on some very, uh, um, very um, key topics, I think, at the moment. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the in the chat, so I mean, we've got about ten to fifteen minutes for questions. So I think if it's all right with you, I'll uh, I'll move on. I mean, the first one we've got a uh, before we go to questions, we've got a comment um, from my colleague Alistair um, Creelman here that um, and he's saying, you know, isn't the main problem with what you're proposing that uh, the the difficulty, the our inability to actually quantify or assess deep learning? I mean, success is is typically determined by rather superficial assessment methods. Yeah, I, yes, yes. Look, let me give you an example of how I see this, uh, this problem, because it has been, um, uh, you know, um, always mentioned in discussions like this one. Um, I used to travel before the pandemic, I used to travel a lot. And I think that many of you did as well. And uh, my experience when I came back on Sunday evening at home, uh, hungry, uh, because I tend to fly economy class where you now you don't get anything. You know, I just opened the, the refrigerator and uh, I used to find sometimes um, a small slice of tortilla de patatas, that's potato omelet, which was drying or aging, you know, in the, in the refrigerator. And usually I tend to keep always some frozen bread. Okay. So the question for me every Sunday when I was returning was the same. Shall I simply use the microwave, uh, uh, you know, and heat uh, uh, the omelet and take some bread and then so I can really go to sleep with something in my stomach or simply, you know, wait until tomorrow. I think that the discussion about, you know, whether we are just talking about the surface or really going uh, into what deep learning is, is the lack of um, um, uh, methods and techniques suited to the complexity of the issue. So now the question is not for me. I prefer to always have a, a small slice of tortilla de patatas because then I can inform my body that I have something that will help me to rest well. You know, I mean, I think I prefer to go for that, but I would understand if others said, well, I prefer not to have anything and wait until tomorrow. Okay, we have been waiting for decades for that kind of, uh, you know, impressive evidence that is not coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and uh, let's see how much longer we have to uh, do we have to do away. Okay, we have a question from uh, from Cobadonga Rodrigo, who thanks you for your presentation. He's particularly interested in your opinion on the on the future of what we might call bimodal learning. You know, when you've got some students actually working from home and others in the class with uh, with the teacher. And I must say, I've I've suffered this because my two elder children who are in university are going through exactly that process. One week they're at home, one week they go in, and it's complicated. What what do you think about this? Well, I think, well, it's, once again, it is difficult to answer. Um, um, my impression is that uh, when it comes to first um, uh, um, students aged between uh, 18 and 24 years old, I think that the experience of being in campus is a transformational one. And I think that nothing compares to the uh, uh, social, cultural, even political experience and learning experience, you know, of uh, not only going uh, to your courses, but actually um, going to the uh, cafeteria, just sitting on the grass and discussing with your colleagues and just learning together how to become an engaged uh, citizen. I think that that transformational experience goes uh, you know, with the real experience of face-to-face uh, uh, -face education for young people. Now, that said, 
when it comes to postgraduate education, particularly when it comes to professional development, I think that nothing compares to the flexibility of that kind of bimodal uh, approaches. Because sometimes you will be in your desk just having plenty of things to do, and you won't find the time to go to the university to follow that course. And that day, you can simply follow that same session from the uh, uh, comfort of your desk. I think that when it comes to postgraduate education, I think that that perspective, that bimodal perspective, that many universities all around Western Europe and the United States are introducing and investing a lot in technology, making it happen, I think that has a lot of future. But certainly, if I was a father of a university student, I would push him or her to certainly go on a daily basis to the university. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, unfortunately, it's not always available, especially when you had to have social distancing and the number of students that were there in the classroom. But I mean, you're completely right. This is not just about um, uh, acquiring knowledge or skills. It's also about um, maturing as a person and interacting with people, the sorts of skills that at the end of the day will make your professional role in life uh, more or less effective. OK, thank you. Moving quickly onwards, our next question is from uh, Sandra Gugina. I mean, if you take into account the um, amount of information that's actually available today, the innovation, you know the changes in society etc do you think that the actual duration of our study programs you know typical four years for um it specialists and engineers or maybe six years for med medical doctors etc do you think we need to to change this um the the, the structure of these courses um no i think uh, well um that's not really uh something that i have uh uh, in mind as, as one of the priorities that uh, um, that UNESCO should have uh, uh, or should promote. I think that in our perspective, what really counts is to have a lifelong learning perspective when it comes to the, uh, um, you know, to particularly higher education. I think that we have to follow the uh, yogurt theory, according to which, you know, you gain a degree, certainly, and I, I wouldn't mind if it, the, the first degree comes after only two years of a study or four or whatever, but they think that it has uh, um, a consumption date that is preferred. And so we should be uh, forcing everyone to go back to universities for reskilling and eventually upskilling, uh, you know, uh, to renew simply their um, competence base and their knowledge as well. So for me, it is more about making sure that we stop with this traditional idea of you go to university and then go to work and forget about university. I think that today's world requires us to uh, come back to universities or any kind of uh, professional and academic education, uh, you know, regularly, recurrently. I think that that would be my priority. Thank you. I, thank you very much. I, I would completely agree with that. I think I'll I've used my, my position as moderator here and actually ask you one of my own questions, if you, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, I think uh, one of the, the, the priorities we all seem to have in, in online and distance education is that of social inclusion, because I mean, the idea is not just necessarily trying to improve the quality of the programs we have, but make our educational offer available to more people in a, a wider space with a, a wider demographic. And it's difficult. I mean, there are many different ways we've, we've tried to do that, you know, with open education, specific, specifically moving away from our, our, our taught courses. How do you think we can address this, this kind of um, problem and what role do you think UNESCO would have in, in this process? Well, um, I think that this is really, really an impressive uh, uh, question. And I'll tell you why, because when we think about how, um, how to measure the impact of the, for instance, the pandemic um, will have on, on higher education students, looking at the situation in, in middle income countries, particularly in Latin America, where I am based now, uh, we always come with the key letter Right? You see that many students in wealthy families that were well equipped, that enjoyed very good high speed connectivity are going to get out of this crisis reinforced in terms of having developed uh, additional skills that were not in the programs, while others, the majority, unfortunately, in Latin America and the Caribbean, will not only uh, have missed the opportunity to develop uh, uh, important digital skills, but also will have important learning losses, the equivalent probably or of a one full academic year. That is our estimate. So certainly, Timothy, I think that the issue of inclusion is extremely relevant and important. And there are two ways by which we can 
struggle with that. I mean, unfortunately, none of them is an immediate recipe, you know, to our need. The first one is already happening, uh, well, already happened in some countries and is happening even more now uh, in some other countries, is um, to make sure that access to the internet becomes a universal human right. It doesn't mean necessarily that it's going to become free of cost, okay? Same as water or electricity or housing, right? But at least having uh, the political consideration of access to internet as a human right makes a lot uh, in terms of ensuring the protection of particularly the most vulnerable ones. That's one thing. Um, some countries, particularly um, Finland, Singapore, or lately now in Colombia, uh, uh, have introduced legislation that really fosters this principle. That's one thing. And the second thing is to make sure that uh, we invest more in those who are more vulnerable, which is not really the case, right? So I would say that if you really want your distance education program, your university to, to be uh, engaged and committed with inclusion and equity, you have to provide means to make sure that not all students are treated equal. The ones who need more should get more. Thank you, Timo. Thank you very much. Um, it's just an excellent reply. Thank you very much. Okay, moving quickly on, there's lots of interesting uh, comments and questions coming up in the, in the chat. I'm not sure I'll be able to process all of them, but um, the next one comes from my colleague, Mark Brown. And he's uh, uh, question and reflection relates to the research paradox. I mean, what, um, what are the major gaps in the research that we need to focus on in the post-pandemic future? And what evidence do you think we need to collect to be able to address these gaps? Well, that's that's a very important question. And unfortunately, I'm not prepared to respond. I think that I have only a, a very a very <laughs> humble knowledge, you know, of what needs to be done. I cannot claim to be, uh, a, you know, a thoughtful researcher in that area. I think that there are promising avenues, certainly, but I would strongly advocate for making sure that our claims about, you know, what seems to work are backed by evidence. And I would, um, you know, recommend strongly that you look to uh, the most important uh, uh, pieces of uh, uh, innovation discourses and see to what extent uh, you would really, if you were a university uh, rector, president, or dean, or head of department, you would really put your uh, effort in promoting. I think that that's the key question, because it's not only about demonstrating what works. It's also about demonstrating that that a particular strategy, method, or approach that seems to work is feasible. And I think that this is really, this has to be part of the conversation. So uh, I'm sorry to be so humble with this. I leave the discussion for the ones who really know, not me, but uh, let me just provide my perspective. Simply uh, add always the column on the cost estimates, because I think that this is going to be very helpful for the ones uh, meant to take decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's a very prudent, sensible answer. I mean, as, as the saying goes, there's no such thing as free. So uh, thank you. Just one more very quick question, and I'm, I'm very conscious of time. I do have, I do apologize to all the people who've asked the questions I can't uh, um, ask. I think this is a good one. This comes from my colleague, uh, Diane Andoni. And uh, she's saying that, you know, PBL um, has been used in STEM for, for some considerable time, especially when it's supported by, by technology. I mean, it's, it's begging to be taken on online. But um, I mean, how do you see the challenge of actually planning and organizing um, these kinds of activities in combination with the cost, especially when we're trying to do it in, um, in group? It's obviously considered by some kind of quality evaluation and accreditation agencies has not been valid for higher education uh, or for, for professional education. I mean, people prefer the good old fashioned evaluation and teaching approaches. I mean, what do you think we should do to try and address this problem? Well, I think, well, if, if that's the case, I'm, I'm well, maybe, sorry, sorry, but let me start again. I, I was about to say, I mean, you better kick off your quality assurance agencies if that's the way of thinking they have, <laughs> because that's not, but it's not my experience. I would say that in, in quality assurance agencies, you also have people that come from the field, from the trenches, so to say, and they are really inspired and willing to be I would say proven, but at the same time, uh, you know, sponsoring innovations because all of them 
are aware of the need and the and the, and the pressing uh, uh, you know the pressing need that, that we all have to move to move ahead. Now, I think that something that I didn't have the time to elaborate on, which I think is is really important, is that we tend to consider that these kind of innovations uh, always come as the result of uh, one individual or a couple of uh, teachers who are committed and decide to go for one particular innovation. I think that the success that I've seen uh, in some uh, departments and universities comes when there is a, a group project, so to say, uh, a group decision, uh, you know, deciding an institutional decision, deciding to uh, really bet for that uh, major change. Let me give you an example. And with that, uh, I would uh, probably finish. Um, over the past 25 years, the um, Technological Institute of uh, Monterrey in Mexico has been engaging in a major transformation of teaching and learning. And I think that this wouldn't have been ever the success it looks like it's having without the full support and esteem from the leadership. So I think that we need to change the perspective and we need to start thinking about how to scale up innovations and engage in uh, institutions or departments at least that are fully committed uh, to promoting change. With that said, Thank you very much. I, I'm fortunately, I don't have the time to respond to so many questions I'm seeing in the chat, uh, but I hope to certainly to continue benefiting from the uh, uh, upcoming sessions. And as I said before, I, you can count on me for the uh, webinars as an end user, uh, a learner, so to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Francis. That was a very interesting uh, session. And I think your uh, opinions have, uh, have greatly added to the, the quality of our, our conference. I'm going to give you a, a virtual clap, I'm afraid. It's not the same as if we were all doing it, but um, but um, uh, that's, that's what there is, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass on to our, our second speaker here, Dor um, Diana Lorillard, and I'm very grateful for your patience, um, Diana. Um, she's Thank a you. professor of learning and with digital technology at the Institute of Education at UC uh, University College London. She was formerly head of um, e-learning strategy unit um, at Development for Education and Skills, and before that, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Learning Technologies at the um, British Open University. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to um, thank all of my distinguished colleagues here for um, the opportunity to join you in this um, uh, uh, celebration. Now, I've did, it, did that actually take that share screen that I tried to do? Are you seeing that? Yes, yes. Slide? We can see You're your. We can see your presentation. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. I've got to remove all these people who floated on the top of my screen here. Okay. Um, so yes, you've got a 30th anniversary and this is really something to be grateful for that the um, Eden Network has been there all, all those years because over the last 30 years or so, we've really seen a lot of changes to the field of digital methods and education. But the changes have never been so rapid as they have over the past year. And one lesson of the, the pandemic, I think, is that the already appalling inequalities that we've seen in our societies have increased. This is the exact discussion you were just having. And there's a broad consensus now that we have to use the experiences of the pandemic to reverse that shameful trend towards increasing inequalities in our societies. So we have the question of what role can universities play in uh, reducing inequality in this way? All universities have the ambitious social aims in our mission statements, but what should we actually do to change the world for the better on the basis of what the pandemic has taught us? And I'm very grateful to Francesc for the, um, uh, the basis that he gave me, because he's been talking about the trends and the, the ways in which we're now developing change and what we should be doing for the future. And that's a very good basis for trying to think, so how on earth do we actually do this? And that's really what I want to try and focus on. And given the, the longevity of this network, Eden members are really in a very good position to reflect on what we can now learn from the pandemic. So that's what I want to discuss with you is how we might move forward on the basis of that learning. And in fact, the discussion that's just been underway, I think has been extremely good in that direction. 
Well, the mission statements of universities are already ambitious, such as those from two of our key British universities, world-class research and education, which benefits society on a local, regional, national, and global scale, the University of Oxford, and then engaged with the wider world and committed to changing it for the better for the long-term benefit of humanity, that's our UCL mission. So we are certainly very ambitious with respect to what we expect to do um, with respect to changing the world, reducing inequality and so on. And higher education does have a critical impact on what the world and, and on the world, as the pandemic has certainly shown us. Um, researchers are on our television screens every night. It's been very impressive. But it's also shown us how those already huge inequalities have been greatly increased. So that's the kind of thing I want to focus on. And I'm going to be offering just one simple kind of contribution that higher education could make to reducing inequalities, and that is to scale up the value and reach of our professional development activities. So it's not just within the undergraduate and postgraduate area, but also beyond that as well with our alumni as they move on. Well, scaling up is essential because the challenges are so great. We all work within the context of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and it's an explicit aim for many of us here to work on SDG4, the education one, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. The very point that I think it was Sandra was making earlier on. Lifelong learning is one of the things that we do have to focus on. But for just education alone, higher education shoulders the responsibility for educating another 68 million teachers by 2030 just to achieve that goal of education for all. But it's worse than that, because in fact, education underpins every single one of the other 16 SDGs as well. The professionals in all of those areas need to know the latest research results and need help in developing their own teams and employees in ways that reduce inequalities. So we need those ambitious aims because universities have the significant responsibility for developing the professionals who will be initiating the changes needed for all 17 SDGs. Those are the very people who are going to make this happen, if it's going to happen at all. Well, this is a huge task for Eden to address as one of the enduring organizations that's been investigating how to do online learning for three decades now. So we're well placed. The problem is that there's really very little help available for academics wanting to innovate with online methods. We all need support in moving to online and blended learning, even those of us who've been brought up in open universities and online learning for many years. But to try and aid this process, we've developed the Learning Designer, which is a free online design tool. It's open and available to all teachers in all sectors in all countries. And it turns the theory-based conversational framework, which I developed some years ago, into actual action. And it does this by providing a structure for developing a sequence of learning activities to achieve the common outcomes that you define. So I want to go through this because it's, it's one of the means by which I think we can come together as an academic community to start collaborating on how best to achieve our ambitious aims. On the website, you can see how to adapt or create a design, analyze or review your own or someone else's design and share or publish designs. So in a sense, it's modeled on what we do as academics in science and scholarship, in contributing to journals, um, in sharing our ideas, in, in building on what other people have done, except within this case, we're sharing ideas about how to teach, not something we typically do. So you can go to the browser screen to explore existing designs from teachers all over the world from other um, range of uh, subject areas and sectors to see if any might be useful for you to borrow as a starting point. And here I've chosen those categorized as vocational education. And from those I've selected one called understanding the topic. And this has been generalized from a pre-existing learning design, which was for understanding a very specific topic. But if I look at this on the designer screen, it's showing the, the basic characteristics of the design at the top, 
and the progress through what students do from introduction to the topic, applying the topic, analyzing how the topic could guide your future work and so on. And from those, um, sorry, um, and I can see that this might be appropriate for me and what I'm wanting to do on my topic. Let's say it's a topic like risk assessment and I want them to understand risk assessment. So I'm going to turn editing on and now in edit mode, I can edit everything on this screen in my what's now my own copy of this design. So you might be able to see here, I've changed all these topic names from risk assessment, so from the topic to risk assessment. Okay, so everything on that screen is editable. And what I'm now going to try and do is give you an idea of how to generate your learning design by expanding the detail of this central teaching learning activity which is now on applying risk assessment. So here you can see there are three of the six different learning types which are in the conversational framework. These are um, learning through production, a produce activity, discussion and collaboration. And the other three learning types are investigation, learning through uh, acquisition and learning through practice. Uh, oh, we've got practice, no, learning through practice is, is the sixth one. So you decide for each section of the learning design you're planning, what kind of learning the student is doing here. And you're encouraged therefore by using this drop down menu to select which of the um, types of learning you're, you're concerned with. You're encouraged to think about what actually is the student doing at this point of view, at this particular point. And each activity has been assigned its unique set of pedagogical uh, features, which you can change if you wish to. So this is the time, this is an activity lasting 10 minutes. This one's 15 and this one's 15. This is a group size of one, the students working on their own. Here they're working in threes. The teacher is not present in any of these. This is all um, being done online by the student. So the internet icon is ticked. This one is asynchronous. So the calendar icon is not ticked and it's ticked in these two places because the students are coming together online and so on. And you can change each of those where you can add different new kinds of activities and so on as you want to adapt this pre-existing design to your own context. Well, the color coding for the learning types matches those in the conversational framework. So you can see that each of these is color coded to identify what kind of learning it is. And because the software knows how much time you've assigned to each type of learning, it can provide this pie chart as feedback on the overall distribution you've now set up of learning types for this session. And that dynamically updates as you develop, as does the total learning time, by the way, because you've specified at the start how long this is meant to be, say an hour and a half in this case. And as you design, you invariably find that you put far more in than you originally planned to do. So that's an important check. Well, now I've clicked on the analysis tab to see what kind of learning experience I've designed for my learners. The pie chart shows I've got mostly learning through discussion, um, both in groups and with the trainer. And there are also other kinds of activities as well. A certain amount of learning through acquisition here and learning through uh, production and collaboration. Then from the smaller pie charts, I can see it's entirely online. It's all pale blue. The teacher is present for about a third of it, that's the dark brown bit, and more than half is uh, synchronous, that's the dark pink bit. And from the bar chart, I can see it's mostly individual work, pale green, with quite a lot of group work and some whole class work. Now, there's no rules about what these distributions should be. But now, as a designer, you've got feedback on what you've done, and you have the opportunity to consider if that looks appropriate for what you're trying to do. But for learning design to be part of a knowledge building process amongst academics, it's important to put it through some form of independent evaluation. So that could be from a peer or a student. Uh, for the peer review here, the simplest way is to add it to this design as another panel, which I've done here. And as you do a review for, for the colleague, of course, this makes you think <clears throat> in a bit more detail about your own design as you reflect on theirs in relation to the rubric. Then you can return to revising your own design with the benefit of that reflection and also with the benefit of your colleagues review of your design. 
And then for the student evaluation, it's useful to suggest that they comment on each panel. And here, both panels are part of the design and the student feedback is in these notes at the bottom. <clears throat> now, this is a design intended to help sports science students in learning to observe the actions of batsmen and investigate the investigate activity in this first panel here is about asking them to watch the detail of a stroke in the video, the student comments that they spent much longer than the allotted time of 10 minutes, and also that the collaborate activity did not have the full group attending. So from this quite detailed feedback on the nature of the student's experience in learning from this session, academics can begin to develop a clearer ideas of what students need, expressed as a continually developing pedagogic strategies, which they're developing through these learning designs. So it's, it's a bit like being able to experiment with a bit more detail of feedback than the usual standard kind of feedback on, on Likert tests or, or whatever would normally give you. So how do we best plan the mix of conventional and digital methods for blended and online learning? What I'm trying to argue here is that we really need a collaborative approach across the whole academic community because university teachers can't do all this on their own. So in our teacher professional development courses, we try to organize not just ideas from experienced teachers, which can show us course videos, but the sharing of ideas among the participants themselves. I'll try and give you an idea of that through um, a course that we're running at the moment, which is on the FutureLearn platform. So it's available everywhere in the world. It's on blended and online learning design. It's free and open to all teachers in all sectors and subject areas again. And this is one way of doing this kind of large scale orchestration of knowledge development about online learning by academics. There's the link to enroll. The current run is going to carry on until next Monday when the next run starts again. And all the course exercises, many of them, are based on using the learning designer, this is the link here, um, which enables these participants to explore and exchange their ideas, to adapt what they've seen in the course and so on. So I'm going to give you a quick taste of what this looks like. Um, in week one, the participants go through the basics of the conversational framework and then work through some exercises together. Uh, and in this step in week two, they're now looking at the principles for good design and then at a learning design, which is specifically aimed to help students learn to explain a complex concept. So this is very much oriented towards a particular kind of learning objective in each case. This example happens to be the concept in physics of the water cycle. That's the one that they're given and they have to try and adapt it and then post to this Padlet wall, the design they have created. And this is a chance to, sorry, missed that. There it is. Um, to look at the range of concepts they can, they can, uh, they can find from uh, understanding a digital mixing desk, a planet conservation plan, regular and irregular verbs, vaccine rebellion, child development, or fellow. I mean, from a physics example, it's quite remarkable and it happens because when we describe our pedagogy, most of the descriptive words we're using about what students are doing, how they're meant to be working, how they're meant to re be relating to each other and the subject. The actual subject matter is quite a small proportion. So these things turn out to be really quite adaptable. And this is the beginning of being able to share, to collaborate when you can share across subject areas like that. Then they continue by exploring different solutions to creating motivation and to engaging students in active learning. And many of the, the, the examples in the videos were contributed by teachers from different sectors, such as this one, um, which is showing how students do peer review of each other's designs for a religious building. And they have to create PowerPoints and so on to do that. And then they peer review and so on. And then it invites participants to adapt that idea for their own content context. In the final week, they start exploring blended methods for formative assessment, and the video here shows teachers' ways of providing peer or blended or automated assessment, and then the participants create their own, again, using the learning designer. Then they go on to do a, a peer review exercise to share and critique each other's designs, beginning now to build that collaborative community of teaching and learning innovation. 
And it's in this final week that we finally turn to talking about workload. And I'm very glad that Francesc um, introduced that because it's so important to understand as we're doing these kinds of things, not only the benefits it's creating for the students, but also the cost to us as teachers in terms of what it takes to organize this. So I want to, in a couple of slides, try and quickly go through this because it's, it's a numbers game and it's, it's quite complex, but I think it's so important for us to understand the estimates for conventional and online methods in terms of teaching costs versus learning benefits. So here's an example I'm gonna try and work through with beginning with a face-to-face -face lecture with Q&A, which will then transfer to an online one, which we'll look at in a minute, to estimate the kind of time, if you run this lecture over say three years, three repeats, three sessions, whatever, and you spend a certain amount of time preparing it, so this is the blue is the preparation hours, that's just over three hours, say, preparing it, and then an hour to actually teach the lecture. And then in the second run, you spend, say, half an hour updating it, and then an hour giving it, half an hour updating, an hour giving it. So you have an estimate over three runs of the total teacher time required for both preparation and running it and support for the students. On the student side, what are they experiencing? Well, they're experiencing 50 minutes of lecture, which is um, a passive learning mode, and then 10 minutes of Q&A and discussion with the teacher, which is a more active learning mode. Comparing that with an online version of that, you'd have to turn that lecture into a series of online videos, quite short videos, readings, quizzes, and activities, and so on, plus some kind of Q&A session. The first time you do it, precisely as Francesca was pointing out, is it takes a lot longer. You're now not presenting a lecture where you're going to be there. You're presenting things for students to do when they're not with you. So this takes much longer. And this is, say, nearly six hours to, to develop what is needed. But then it's digital. So it's quite a short amount of time to update it. Um, what I've put built in here as the Q&A is a half hour online um, synchronous session, which actually gives the students a bit more time with the teacher in discussing, and then a short time um, each on each occasion to increase the, um, uh, sorry, to update what, the, what is in all these videos. Now on the student side, you've got quite a different kind of analysis because now we've got um, just over half the time probably spent in active learning because of the quizzes and the, the exercises which have been set as, as part of this process. And the passive learning time is going to be watching the videos and, and reading the, uh, the readings which have been set. But the shift, the, the balance of what students are actually doing, and this speaks to the, um, the flip learning point that uh, Francesca was making earlier on, I think, is that if you flip all of that video to students watching on their laptops, they're just not going to do it. They're not going to watch 50 minutes of video, you talking on a laptop. But what they are going to do is five minutes of video and then a quiz and then another exercise and then collaborate with their colleagues and, and so on. So they're much more likely to do that kind of thing. So that's the kind of analysis, comparative analysis, I think we should be thinking about. And in one such study, um, looking at this in precisely in, in those sorts of terms, the teacher time to prepare and support the session was 8% more over three runs. Of course, if you go... If you just compare one run, one run, the teacher time was that much to prepare and that much to um, present, but that much to prepare and that much to present for online, that's very different. So you really have doubled the amount of teacher time if you just count one run. It's very important to get that, uh, that uh, payoff over time. The students had 30% more guided study time online, and the guided is important and not just left on their own. Students had four times as much active learning online. So it is possible to have considerable learning benefit for the long term with a relatively small increase in teacher workload over the long term. But that initial increase in teacher workload was 50% for one run in that particular situation. Now, you know, it's going to be different in every context, but that's the kind of analysis I think we have to do. And that's what we've been trying to get teachers to engage with. So this is a bold future we can now envisage for the academic community. Teachers sharing innovative ideas, 
in a collaborative community. Do they think this would be valuable? Well, we did ask. We've got about 11,000 enrollments in this course at the moment. Um, so we're asking, what would you think it would be valuable? And this particular comment is, is quite typical, where Fatima says, sharing lesson designs is highly important for expertise exchange. It can bridge the gap between teaching communities and foster transnational uh, teaching cooperation, and this can create a universal experience that will benefit well-experienced and less experienced teachers, as well as learners themselves. So the idea of sharing and building on each other's ideas um, and designs is understood and accepted by a lot of these teachers from all sectors who are taking this course. It's not to say it will be accepted by all, but this is pretty early beginnings. So this is the kind of claim I'm making. If we work together, we can share the great innovations needed now to guide the transformation to this bold new future for teaching, which is hybrid and mixed and blended and however we want to describe it. Um, we should be in charge of it and we should be pushing that. We should have the initiative, not allowing others to guide it for us. And my great anxiety is that the the big tech companies, the big corporations have now got the sense that online learning is going to be big now. And more than ever before, they're going to pitch in and say, we know how to do this. We'll give you the AI and all the rest of it, which will um, enable this to happen quite automatically. And they are not the people who understand education. They do not understand what it takes to teach and what it takes to learn. So it's so important that the teaching profession owns this and really works on achieving it. And that will mean if we do this kind of thing, we can empower the teaching profession to be much more influential consumers of the way that technology is used in education. Does it work? Well, many of the discussion posts in the course were enthusiastic. Um, I've got lessons to plan lined up for the learning designer. The last one I gave was observed formally towards PGC and was very well received for the balance, variety and methodology. Another one is sharing best practice, the best way, way to learn. Sharing my designs have been useful and I've received valuable feedback. Now, this is not quantitative feedback. It's different, difficult to demonstrate in a positivistic way um, that this is uh, an improvement and will work for everybody. It probably won't work for everybody. But it does work for a lot of people. And yes, they have contributed their learning designs for public sharing into the curated design section of the browser. And across quite a range of subject areas, as I showed you before, we've got infographics on the digital divide, purpose of communication, linear and binary searches, developing commercial awareness um, in uh, primary schools, shape and space, uh, 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 a design on that, all kinds of things. So, yes, it could work, although, as I said, this is still the early days. So at UCL, we're experimenting with these new ways of extending the impact of HE research outputs on the professionals who need them, testing the feasibility of this model of collaborative professional development. And it does begin to show some large scale effects. Last year, in a desperate response to the, the sudden need to teach online, we launched a MOOC on teaching online, and this was in Arabic for the MENA region, where so few people had ever had any experience of creating online learning. And that's um, <clears throat> so far attracted over 46,000 enrollments across that region, where teachers who once rejected the idea of online learning, hands down, they had nothing to do with it, have now been able to discover its value and the part it can play alongside conventional methods. So all everything that everybody was saying in the opening session this morning is absolutely true. It is really changing attitudes. Here are some of the comments in the post course survey that we, we ran. How has it changed your future planning for online learning? Someone says, I made many adjustments to the study plans and innovated new ideas and methods. We were using traditional education methods and it became a transformation in life. And then how have your students benefited? The level of, evalu of evaluation was very good to excellent. Everybody was ready and waiting for the next day's task. They've really sensed you know, something new here. So there is some evidence, a fairly immediate local impact beyond the participants in the course. To do something towards documenting the impact of the approach, we've used Etienne Wenger's value creation framework, which I do recommend because it's quite useful, these five different types of value creation. 
And the intervention itself could be anything, of course, it could be a community project or a citizens assembly or a course, anything that brings people together to make a positive change in the world. In our case, we categorize the survey comments in terms of the kind of value creation they evidence, like immediately it was debate enriches information and gives you new dimensions. <coughs> or the potential, the use of all these online tools increased student activity. Um, applied value, moving from traditional methods to innovative methods of introducing students and parents in the educational process. And that comment on parents is very important because that's one of the things the pandemic has done. It's shown the importance of these kinds of developments which has been made more possible, connecting to the school to the parent than was ever possible before um, the pandemic. And then we found some comments on uh, reframing. Reframing is where the action triggers a rethink by the community of their whole approach. And comments like this, expanding horizons and realizing the importance of dis distance education. Among these teachers who had previously really rejected the idea. So even in this short course, it was only two weeks, it was about eight hours. This kind of interaction was having a demonstrable impact on many of these participants and their work um, students. And by the way, the um, uh, citations, bibliographic references are in these slides when you eventually get them. Then in the very different field of renewable energy, we collaborated with colleagues in engineering and international development and researchers in Lebanon to create a course on energy and the SDGs, especially SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. So this course showcases the stories and solutions found in some of the most challenging communities. And the participants, mostly community leaders and education professionals, <coughs> excuse me, are then able to share their experiences and solutions with others. Exchanging these experiences and useful advice is all part of the collaborative learning process. And we see the same thing again here in the Padlets and Word Clouds and the mini game that they created to try and run a mini energy grid supply and then share their experiences online. Padlet, um, ex sorry, Padlet exchanges where they're uh, again sharing their experiences and when we asked them about how it, um, energy access impacts on you, and they were able to say, this was a comment from someone in Iraq, for example, talking on the negative effects on personal, um, mental and physical health in this case. So the point is that just as in the education examples, these are knowledgeable professionals sharing their ideas, experiences and solutions with the help of this kind of collaborative learning platform, gradually building across the world, reaching into all of those localities where understanding is needed. And this is our university research being, reaching out, being able to reach out into entirely different kinds of places. So I would say the early results show from these trials is that yes, we can scale up the value and reach of university research through these kinds of professional development activities, no matter what the subject. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so to summarize, I'd just like to relate <clears throat> the implications of these approaches to some of the conference themes. First, the evolution of online and distance learning. Well, over the last year, that evolution has been something like a, a Cambrian explosion of activity, a great outpouring of experimentation and discovery by teaching communities all over the world. Online learning has actually has some significant advantages over conventional methods. That is beginning to be understood. Students have also woken up to this and they're now demanding more blended learning in their courses, as we've been hearing. Good, that's good, but now there's a downside in that the move to online is expensive of teacher time. And we must beware of those over-enthusiastic HE leaders and managers who now want to switch everything to hybrid and high flex and dual modes. These increase the workload even further. Academics are very aware of the additional upfront workload involved and at the same time is learning about it and at the same time is continuing to teach. So every strategy for moving forward must focus on the well-being of both teachers and students. And the best way to do that is to listen to them. Do nothing without consulting them. Give them the means to develop this new community knowledge of how to teach using digital methods. And I've explained how some, we might do some of those. 
And to effect this transformation, I think we must now focus on the scale of the innovation needed. Use collaboration to innovate, as we do in science, but almost never do in teaching. And because we've never done that, we don't have the mechanisms for spreading that load of innovation, but we could. I've shown how developing a collaborative community of professionals online is possible. We have the technology to scale up professional development. We have MOOC platforms, so use them. Not for direct undergraduate education, I'm not advocating that, because personal tuition doesn't scale, but we can embed MOOCs in our undergraduate courses, again, to lessen the load of innovation. And work through the professionals. Universities must do more to put professional education online, and those professionals will in turn benefit their students or their colleagues or their employees to work towards those high ambitions that I first began with. Educating the professionals who will learn how to meet the requirements of the UN SDGs. Nothing less than that. That's what we have to do. And with your 30 year pedigree, the Eden Network is very well placed to influence these new directions. So this is what I look forward now to discussing with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana, for a very uh, interesting and uh, relevant uh, presentation. I was, uh, as an engineer myself, love to see uh, systems that are actually applied to <laughs> educational uh, applications because you can actually see in the data. It doesn't leave so much space for, uh, exactly. for, for a discussion. <laughs> so the, the more of those. Um, okay, I can see the questions coming up, but before I um, let other people participate, let me please just ask you one um, question. You were talking about... Um, you know, tailoring our, our educational offer to the perhaps the more to the realities and demands of the, of the corporates and uh, and companies and such. Um, how do you feel about involving them in the in the educational design from the very beginning? Because sometimes I think we sometimes think that we educators know best when we do it, and afterwards our, our graduates pop out at the end of the process ready for life in the in the in a professional context. I mean, how can we can we change that dynamic? Do you think? Um, who were you saying should be brought in from day one? Sorry, the, the, the corporate partners, the companies, where are <clears throat> Well, yes, are fine, to... as long as the, the academics are leading that process. Uh, but equally, the students should be brought in from day one as well. Um, we, we need to listen to their voices and learn from them, because this is going to be a process of learning for all of us. So I do think that's important. Yes, I agree. OK, thank you very much. In which case, I'm going to pass over to some of the, the comments and questions um, coming up in the... Uh... In the chat, interesting comment from my colleague Irina that um, it's nice the way that you're actually visualizing the teacher workload because I think sometimes we we complain that we're taken for granted sometimes in the in the the, the, so. the expectations and it's actually nice to uh, to see that. Yeah. So do you think the sort of tool you've got there, the learning designer, could actually be used for communicative um, internal processes as well as um, pedagogic ones? Well, actually, there's another tool for assessing the, um, the costs and benefits, um, which is it's, it's a bit more like a sort of glorified spreadsheet because it really is about numbers. Um, and whereas the learning designer is about pedagogy and it's possible that in, we might be able to integrate the two in future, but it's a bit complicated. We haven't quite got there yet. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, I mean, essentially, but, you know, the, the other tool, which does the kind of thing, which is where those um, bar charts came from showing that com comparison. I think both teachers need to do that because they do become aware that way of how they're spending their time. But most importantly, the managers need to understand that because they tend to think online is cheaper and you know you can do everything much more easily and so on. It's not the case. It's not as simple as that. So they have to be educated too. I quite agree. I hope all the managers here listening to you uh, please <laughs> pay note of that because it's a very wise words. I think it's a very relevant. OK, moving quickly onwards, there's a, a nice uh, question from uh, Mark Brown in the chat here that um, learning design operates at different levels. I mean, we've got the individual lessons, we've got the course level and then you've got the whole program level. I mean, what advice would you give to this um, in trying to apply this LD approach to the whole program level, not just at the lower levels? Well, I wouldn't apply the learning design at the whole program level. You have to, to stand back from that and you usually need to have teamwork around the table. Uh, we, one of the things we do with colleagues at um, UCL is, is work on a kind of workshop basis. And you've got large sheets of paper and post-it notes and things like that, because you're really thinking at quite a large level. 
the learning designer is thinking about what does it take for the learner to achieve this learning objective, which I've defined over this period of time. And the period of time might be a week or so, but it probably wouldn't be much more than that. Um, so there are very different levels of granularity. Um, that's absolutely right. And, and I think for that, thinking through the program level, you need um, a bigger space. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it on a spreadsheet to begin with, but I would transfer to a spreadsheet or something like that. You know, so you've got to, to think imaginatively to begin with. And, you, and that's where you want a kind of blank sheet of paper almost. Absolutely. Think outside of the box. I think that's, uh, that's very good. I mean, nice comment and question from um, my colleague, Diane um, Andoni. She's saying thank you for the, the presentation and referring to a, another project, which was also uh, led by UCL and which uh, uh, our president, Sandra, was a partner. And the question is, uh, do you see, um, if you like, a, a further development to include um, technology and tools? I mean, specifically open educational resources and practices. Do you think, how do you see this evolving? And also... Um, in a related question, how would this relate to the workload of the teachers who have to actually, actually have to use these tools? Well, it would be helpful if the tools are aimed at trying to support teacher workload and trying to, to minimise that. And yes, of course, we're going to, to be developing new tools and resources, but I think those have to evolve. And the more academics, um, I mean, just talking about higher education for the moment, the more that... Uh, Academics are involved in the process of design, and it's not farmed out to a sort of central unit in the university to do it for them, as if, you know, anybody would farm out their, um, their, their lecture for somebody else to create for them. I mean, it's absurd. You have, to, you have to own the teaching that you're doing. So you need the tools to design. That's why something like the design, learning design is very simple to use, and people kind of enjoy it because you get, you know, kind of pie chart for some reason <laughs> people absolutely love the pie chart and it's feedback so um <clears throat> it's important to have those kinds of tools which have really never been created for teachers i mean the best we've had is lms's i suppose and they're really not very good um so we do need that kind of help but they will evolve all the more that more teachers and academics are involved in the process of doing that and it is my hope that will happen but they have to be adaptive so we have um, all kinds of digital resources which can be useful, but you've got to be able to adapt that digital resource to your context. And that's why the learning designer is about not just expressing your pedagogy, but being able to share it with someone and then change someone else's to suit your own context. And then we begin to act as if we're... Uh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say uh, scientists exactly. I think it's more like being design scientists. Indeed. Like engineers, you know, <laughs> it teaches, teaching is an engineering issue. It's, it's not science, it's engineering. And we're experimenting, building on theory, yes, but we're, we're finding the best solution to what we've got. Yes, I think, uh, I think it would be good if we were all engineers after a fashion. Um, I think there's also still a role for instructional designers at an institutional level, though, because, I mean, we oh, can't yes. necessarily assume that all teachers, no, while being experts in their own domain content, will necessarily know the best ways to, to com communicate. Yes, but you've got to put the academic in charge of that process hmm. and enable them to develop the ideas. And workshopping it is, is one way to do it. And uh, we can do that, but also give them the tools. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And done in a, in a scalable and supportive fashion, because I think sometimes the resistance coming from our colleagues is that I've got quite enough to do preparing my classes, etc., to now have to learn a new tool to, uh, to use with my students. Maybe that's not uh, your case, but uh, sometimes. No, it, but uh, that is true. <laughs> you know, the tariffs we have <clears throat> for what it takes to teach <clears throat> are usually created by people who don't teach. And they are not uh, knowledgeable. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Diane. That was really a very interesting uh, uh, presentation and some, some great questions and comments coming up in the chat. I'm sorry we, we haven't got a lot of time to, to carry on with that. Once again, I'm, I'm going to give you a virtual clap. And thank you very well, much. Thank you very much. I'll join in the chat retrospectively. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very decent of you. Thank you very much indeed.